needs of his wonderful preaching, and I'm going to say what I'm going to say and get out of his way. I said to him before coming in tonight that after listening to him preach last night, pimping a butterfly, he's going to make me go out and buy hip-hop, amen. But he is certainly a preacher of rare and exquisite gift. Let's celebrate him tonight. <clears throat> Glad to see one of our disciples who has relocated here to Phoenix, Miss Wanda Steptoe, who just came in. Her mother and her brother are stalwart persons in the life of our church. She was born and raised in the Mount Olivet Church, and she lives out here now in the Valley of the Sun. And I was hoping before I take my leave that I would see her. So it's a joy to see you tonight, and I'll tell the saints that you are doing well when you're coming back home. Amen. All right. Praise God. It's a joy to greet all of these preachers who are here tonight. Reverend Allen, who has been here every night, Dr. Fairley, Dr. Wade, and others who are here. We thank God for your presence and for the support that you have given to all of us. Open your Bibles, if you will, tonight <clears throat> to the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the law, the fifth book of the Pentateuch, the fifth book of Moses, one of the great books of beginning as we unravel a portion of Israel's history. In the 20th chapter of Deuteronomy, beginning at verse 1, the New International Version of Scripture renders our text this way. Deuteronomy chapter 20, beginning at verse number 1. When you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots, and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them, because the Lord your God, who has brought you up out of Egypt, will be with you. When you are about to go into battle, the priest shall come forward and address the army. He shall say, Hear, Israel, today you're going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not panic or be terrified by them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Let me read that fourth verse again. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Let the body of Christ say amen. amen. You may be seated. Tonight in this closing segment that is entrusted to my care and responsibility, I want to preach about the impossibility of defeat. The impossibility of defeat. One of the things that I am convinced of beyond the shadow of any doubt is that the faith that we embrace as Judeo-Christians is not a faith that is weak, it is not a faith that is sentimental, it is not a faith that is passive, nor is it a faith that is in any way less than dynamic. So many in the African American community many years ago vacated the faith because they Consider the gospel of Jesus Christ to be weak and passive, when in actuality the gospel that we preach and the Christ we believe in is dynamic, active, and very much engaged in the lives of men and women. In this wonderful passage that I've read to you tonight coming up out of Old Testament antiquity, we find the people of God freshly coming out of slavery. They have moved from incarceration to emancipation. And they are now on the brink of going into the promised land, the land that had been promised to Abraham and his seed. And one hears across the chasm of the years the wonderful promise that God had given to Abraham, for he told Abraham, I will bless them that bless you. 
and I will curse them that curse you. Not only will I bless your friends and curse your enemies, but I shall make of you and your seed a great nation. In fact, you shall be so great that you will outnumber the grains of sand upon the seashore. And your posterity will go far beyond the stars that stud the sky. One of the things that has greatly intrigued me across the years is the fact that God had given to Abraham and his seed a promise. The promise of land, the promise of real estate, the promise of property. But the land promised to the children of Israel was land already occupied. One would think that the land that these people had been promised would have been vacated land, especially when you consider the fact that these Jews had been held captive, entrapped, enslaved for almost one half of a millennium. 400 years is a long time to be enslaved. And yet in that entrapment period, there was always in their mental sky the promise that God had given to Abraham. And they believe that one day the promise of God will become real. Our mothers and our fathers put it this way. They said that God may not come when you want him. But when he shows up, he's always right on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Why would God promise his children land already occupied, land already occupied by people who were heathens, people who were idol worshipers, people who were pagans. These Jews had been held captive for 400 years and now on the brink of going into the promised land. They are told by Moses in one of his sunset messages that in order to really inhabit the land, you're going to fight for the land. The land is not going to be given to you, just hand it over, if you will. But if you're going to occupy the land, you're going to have to fight for the land. And I do not think that anybody would disagree with me tonight when I say that anything in life worth having is worth fighting for. One of the problems I think that we have today in the African-American community is that we have lost our zest and zeal to fight. And we're rolling over and playing dead. If drug people occupy our community, it's because we have laid down our arms and we are not willing to fight. If violence has overtaken our communities, it's because we are not fighting with the power of the gospel that the Lord Christ has given to us. Where is the fight in us? Moses assembles the children of Israel. And Moses tells the children of Israel that the land is ours. And the promise of God is now, after all of these years, getting ready to take place. But if we're going to go into the promised land, having come now out of the Red Sea, we're going to fight for the land. And anybody who's not willing to fight is somebody who's not willing to hear what God really wants for his children to do. Where is the fight in you tonight? Of what good should we talk about shift if there is no willingness to fight for what you're shifting to? Now, I know I'm talking to a sophisticated audience and that there are many of you who don't believe in Satan, but there is an adversarial power who is operative in the universe tonight, and he's operative in you and in me. When I speak of an adversarial power, I'm speaking of the satanic one. I'm speaking of the demonic one. I'm speaking of the devil. I'm not talking about some Halloween character who's red in body with pointed ears and a pointed, toe, a pointed tail with a spear in his hand, but I'm talking about a power that is able to turn us away from the God we love. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities, the rulers of darkness in this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. 
Am I by myself tonight? Or does anybody here have a testimony that the devil is real? Come on, I don't care how educated you are. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have. The devil is real. And right now, he wants to keep you from the shift that God wants you to make. From conversation to conduct. And so Moses assembles the children of God. Tells them that we've come out of the Red Sea and we're getting ready to go into the land. But God says that if we're going into the land, we must fight for it. Now the wonderful thing about fighting when we talk about God is that with God we cannot lose. Anybody who says that you lose with God doesn't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't know the God who is Elohim. He doesn't know the God who is El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. I wish I had some Pentecostal people in here tonight. I know I'm in a Baptist church, but there ought to be something apostolic about our gathering because the minute you talk about God and his power, the minute you talk about God, you're automatically talking about victory and not defeat. When you talk about God, you're talking about the mountain and not the valley. Because with God, I can do all things because all things are possible. Come on, I feel it tonight. If you only believe. We don't sing the hymns much in the church. And I don't mind confessing to you that I love the hymns. Every Sunday morning in the Mount Olivet Church, we begin with a hymn. And there was a hymn that comes to my mind when I think about this business of fighting for my shift. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? But then there's that third verse. Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, as long as I am supported by thy word. You will have to fight for the shift that you are trying to attain. And somebody ought to tell the devil right now that you are a liar. My shift is going to take place. I'm going from good to better. And I'm going from better to best because God says it is impossible for me to be defeated. Uh, I may fail, but I won't be defeated. Uh, I may endure a setback, but I will not be defeated. Those who occupy the land are greater than we are in numbers. Those who occupy the land are superior to us in weaponry. But because we have God on our side, the numbers don't matter. And the superiority in weaponry is inconsequential because I cannot lose. Defeat is not in my vernacular. Not only is it not in my vernacular, it's not in my mind. Look at some of you. You haven't said amen yet. Sitting there with your arms folded and your legs crossed as if you're doing God a favor by being here tonight. Many of you already are living in a defeatist mentality. But there ought to be a smile on your face. Because if God be for me, that's better than the whole world against me. I may be down tonight, but by tomorrow morning, I'm going to be up on my feet. Because God has promised never to leave me but to always stand with me and to give me victory. I argue on the side of this equation from victory and not defeat. Because when I come out of the battle, my God help me. I'm not just going to have victory, Dr. Haynes. I'm going to be more than a conqueror. Is it possible for me to get to a more than conqueror praise tonight. Can somebody give God a more than conqueror thank you tonight? 
Before I get anywhere near the end of the sermon, can you give God glory and give God praise for who he is and the power he possesses? Shake somebody's hand and tell them, it is impossible for me to be defeated. I can't answer for you. In fact, if you are defeatist, get off my roll. I don't need that kind of negation on my road tonight. I need folk tonight who claim victory and know that victory is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory belongs to me. Somebody throw your nappy head back and holler victory. It is impossible for me to be defeated. What an audacious claim. By what right do I have to stand before you on a Tuesday night and tell you that I can't be defeated? Somebody might say that's arrogance. No, that's not arrogance. That's amazing self-confidence. Especially when you know who I'm dealing with. You can't see him. It looks like I'm up here by myself. But I've got God the Father who created me. I've got God the Son who saved me. And I've got God the Holy Ghost who brings back to my remembrance all of the things that Christ has commanded. He comforts and he keeps me and he promises me triumph. What makes me say that I cannot be defeated? Notice what the text says. I'm a biblicist. I don't preach what I think. I don't preach what is my opinion. And for you young preachers, you need to understand that the pulpit is not a place for your opinion. Nobody cares what you think. What does the word of God say? When you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them because the Lord, your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, stop. The God who brought you up out of Egypt. I cannot be defeated when I think about the fact that I have a trophy case. This isn't the first time I've gone up against the adversary. This isn't the first time that I've gone up against the enemy. This is not the first time that he has tried to block or oppose me, Dr. Fairley, in my shift. I've got a trophy case. And everybody in here has a trophy case. You can look back now and see how God has already given you triumph and victory over things in the past. Don't act like this is the first time you've done the tango with Satan. He's been on your case ever since you've been born. And every time he's been on your case, God has given you victory. You have a trophy case. So that whenever the adversary comes before you, whenever the shift is getting ready to be made, put your mind on rewind. And think about what God has already done. And if God has already been good to you, if God has already made a way for you, then you ought to have enough sense to know that if he did it then, he'll do it one more time. Most of us don't realize that every battle you fight is first fought in your mind. Your psychology determines whether or not you will win or lose, success or succeed or fail. If you think failure, you will be a failure. But if you think success, you will be successful. Look at the Israel, the people of God, the Jews, down in slavery 400 years. They wondered if God would hear their prayers. And you and I wonder from time to time whether or not God will hear our prayer. Anybody can say, been there, done that? 
You call on him for years and years and you're still living with that burden on your spirit. When will God deliver us from incarceration? When will God deliver us from entrapment? When will God deliver us from enslavement? We are called upon to make bricks without straw. Our backs are up against the wall. Our women are being raped. We're living beneath the lash of the rawhide overseer. And yet God talks to us about a land of promise. And here we are, fresh out of slavery. And you would think that after 400 years, we would be able to waltz into the promised land. But now, after almost one half of a millennium coming up out of enslavement, now we've got to fight for the land. And we don't have an army. If we've been enslaved for 400 years, and God says we've got to fight, with what? If you languish beneath what is the oppression of Pharaoh, obviously he has not allowed the Jews to build anything that even resembles military might. No marching army. No sailing navy. But yet God tells them that they must fight. Listen to the language of Moses. Listen to his vernacular. He says, don't be afraid even though they are superior to you in numbers. Don't be frightened even though they are superior to you in weaponry. Because even though you have no marching army, and even though you have no sailing navy, and even though, unlike Pharaoh, you do not have horses and chariots and military might, you have what Pharaoh does not have, me. Don't languish on what you don't have. Because God is in charge of creation. And God can marshal the resources of nature. On your behalf. So that if I want to, I'll use some frogs. If I choose, I'll use some flies. If I choose, I'll use some gnats. If I choose, I'll use some locusts. I'll be your pillar of cloud by day. Preach Charles Booth. And I'll be your pillar of fire by night. And if he doesn't listen to me, I'll bring the death angel out of storage. March him through Egypt and kill the firstborn male in every house that does not have the blood of the paschal lamb sprinkled on the doorpost. You can't lose with the stuff I use. Don't look at what they have. Look at who I am. Every black person in here ought to be getting ready to shout right about now. Because there is no explanation for African American people to be where we are, except that there is a God somewhere. We are not supposed to be here tonight. Look at all of the obstacles we've had put in our path. Look at how we were placed into slavery, snatched from our homeland in West Africa, brought across the watery deep of the Middle Atlantic. And yet here we are. I saw the BMWs out on the lot. I saw the Lexuses out on the lot. I see the St. John nits that are in the house. And you sitting up here trying to be all cute. You better give God glory. You better give God praise. Nobody has brought us to where we are except by the grace, the might, and the power of God. Our education comes from God. Our economics comes from God. Our political savvy comes from God. Barack's in the White House because of God. They've thrown everything at us. The Dred Scott decision of 1857. They said black people had no rights that white people were bound to respect. Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. That said separate but equal was constitutional. But here we are. 
despite what they have put in our path. You want to know why Barack Obama has caught hell his eight years? Because the powers that be in the Republican Party, the conservatives, the Tea Party people, hate the fact that in 2008, a black man occupied the White House. Mitch McConnell, the senator from Kentucky, said after the election of Barack Obama in 2008 that for the next four years, we have but one goal, one ambition, and that is to get that black man out of the White House. But the God that I say says defeat is impossible. You thought I could just do it in 2008? He turned around and did it again in 2012. Somebody ought to shout right about now that it ain't no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. Come on, let's have church. With arms wide open. I said with arms wide open. He'll see you through. It ain't no secret what God can do. She walking around here looking all sad for. You got a trophy case. Every time you think about the victory that God has given you, give him a praise. Every time that God has defeated your enemy, give him a praise. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Here's the shout. Each victory will help you some other to win. Throw your head back and holler, I can't be defeated. In fact, give him a shout in advance. Not only do I have a trophy case, but the text says, when you are about to go into battle, the priest shall come forward and address the army and say, here, Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies, but don't be faint-hearted. Don't be afraid. Don't panic and don't be terrified. For the Lord, your God, is with you. In other words, before you go into battle, you've got to have some marching order. Notice what Moses does. Moses is the emancipator, but not the preacher. The liberator, but not the mouthpiece. And Moses says, we will not fight until we hear from God. And we shall hear from God through his conduit, through his trumpet, through his mouthpiece, the preacher. Not the academician, not the educator, not the social scientist, not the political activist, but we need to hear a word from God. We need encouragement. We need inspiration. Now there are two ways to understand a word. Word must be understood in the context of logos. Jesus is the eternal logos. The word made flesh that has dwelt among us. Isn't that what John said? And the word became flesh dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the father full pregnant with grace and truth that's word is real in the context of logos but there's word in another context rhema 
Ara, H-E-M-A, which means that which God must give me for my particular predicament, for my circumstance, for my particular problem. Anybody who is here tonight who's concerned seriously about shift must have a word for what you are about to engage in. Because shift automatically means that in order to reach the destination of conduct, you will have to go through something or somebody. And in many instances, to go through something means that passivity cannot be in your vocabulary. There must be the willingness to fight. Now notice what the text says. The text says that the priest will only talk to those who are willing to fight. If it's not your intent to fight, this word ain't for you. The word that the priest has is not a word for punks. It's not a word for chumps. It's for folk who are ready to fight. Do I have an army in here? Do I have any fighters in here? Do I have some sisters who are not afraid to fight? Do I have some brothers who are not afraid to fight? I ain't talking about the brothers on the fence. I'm talking about real men tonight. Somebody holler, I'm ready to fight. I'm not going to roll over and die. I'm ready to fight. Give me my word of encouragement. I need rhema tonight. A word that's going to inspire me. I love that. Where would we be tonight as an African American people if it were not for the preacher? The boys in the souls of black folk talks about the griot. The only original transplant from the West African forest who stood in the midst of Africans to give them one information and two inspiration. The preacher is before you not just to inspire you, but to inform you and to let you know that he's not just about hand clapping and foot stomping, but he has a word. I wish I had somebody. Who would holler with me tonight? Is there a word from the Lord? Is anybody here hungry? Jesus said in that great beatific vision in the gospel of Matthew, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I've got one interrogative for you tonight. Is anybody here hungry? Bread of heaven. Mm. Bread of heaven. Feed me till I want no more. I'm not talking to you people who are not starving. But I need to talk to somebody who is hungry tonight for the word of the living God. Can I feed you the word tonight? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light upon my path. Greater is he that is inside of me than he that is in the world. I'm feeding you now. No weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Thy word is like fire shut up in my bones. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. But the ungodly, are not so. They are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. 
Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. I'm giving you word tonight. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainted not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. The young men shall faint and fail and the young men and young women shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like an eagle. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. I'm talking to starving people. Put on the whole armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the girdle of truth, the sandals of peace, the shield of faith, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of the Lord. But I want to give you now a dessert. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Come on, here's the shout. When my enemies came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. Though an host should encamp against me in this will I be confident one thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life here it is for in the time of trouble he shall hide me beneath his wing shall he hide me he shall set me up upon a rock tell somebody I got my meal and I'm ready to fight I got my meal and come hell or high water I shall not be defeated sit down sit down sit down cannot be defeated because I have a trophy case I cannot be defeated because I have a ream of word of encouragement and inspiration but Dr. Wade listen to what he says finally and I'm out of your way for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemy to give you the victory notice what the text does not say the text does not say for the Lord your mama's God or the Lord your daddy's God the Lord your God what I did for them, I did for them. But now I'm getting ready to blow your mind. How I delivered them may not necessarily be how I choose to deliver you. See, one of the mistakes we make is that we're always telling people what God has done for us, which is good. We love to talk about doors God has opened for us, ways that God has made for us. But we ought not tell people that the way he did it for me is going to be the way he'll do it for you. Y'all ain't get it. What I'm trying to say, Dr. Haynes, is this. God customizes deliverance. You ought to thank him tonight. That how God delivers depends upon your circumstance. 
how God emancipates depends upon your predicament. He customizes your deliverance. That's why people shout based on what God has done for them. And you can't understand why he shouts over here and nobody shouts over here. Well, you don't know what he did for me over here. And when I think about what he did for me over here and the door he opened for me over here, I don't care whether folk like it or not. I'm going to give him glory and I'm going to give him praise because he thought enough of me in my uniqueness to customize my deliverance. Ain't no telling how God's going to bring you out. I don't know how he's going to do it. But I know this. He's going to do it. Come here, Daniel. He customized my deliverance. Brought me out of the lion's den. Come here, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. He customized our deliverance by bringing us out of the fiery furnace. Come here, Paul and Silas. He customized our deliverance by bringing us out of Philippian jail. Come here, Bunyan. He customized your deliverance by bringing you out of the Bedford jail. Come here, Mandela. He customized your deliverance by bringing you out of South African apartheid. Come here, Martin King. He customized your deliverance by bringing you out of the Birmingham jail. Can I get a witness? Has he customized your deliverance? Won't he bring you out of sickness? Won't he bring you out of bitterness? Won't he bring you out of depression? Won't he bring you out of disappointment? Won't he bring you out of heartache? Won't he bring you out of heartbreak? Then why don't you thank him for customizing your deliverance? One Friday, out on a hill called Calvary, my God and your Savior hung between the living and the dead. They put nails in his hands. They put a spike in his feet. Put a crown of thorns in his head. Put a spear in his side. And somebody said, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. Can I get a witness? He died. All day Friday. He died. All night Friday. He died. All day Saturday. He died. All day Saturday night. God opened the trap door. Of his soul. And let his soul go down into hell. Where he preached. The emancipation. Proclamation. To those chained in darkness. But early. I said early, early, early on Sunday morning, he got up, 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 yeah, he got up, not with some power, but with all power. Shake somebody's hand like you're going to shake it off. Tell somebody, I cannot be defeated. I cannot be defeated. Ah, yeah.